If you look at the birth of Kauravas and everybody wonders and nobody believes, how come Gandhari gave birth to 100 children? Is it humanly possible? Can any woman give birth to 100 children in one lifetime? Is it humanly possible? So again, people believe that no, 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 Kauravas are not there. It's only fictitious. No cover of us. But now we believe. When we have test tube babies. And again Mahabharata says the same thing. Hundred fertilized eggs are put into hundred earthen parts. Is it not test tube baby? It's making test tube baby. Stem stem cell research. Stem cell research was done in this country thousands of years ago. Today we speak about stem cell research. Well, those of you who are not aware, that was a bizarre claim made by Mr. G. N. Rao, the Vice Chancellor of Andhra University at the recently concluded Indian Science Congress um, meeting. You see, when the lines between history and politics blur, what you get are these bizarre claims because at the end of the day, they do, they do get rewarded. Nowadays, you get to hear all these uh, really crazy speeches uh, of our culture being thousands and thousands of years old and uh, manuscripts, which is some say 1,000 years old, some say 10,000, some say 100,000 or a million years old. And what you get is all these claims that India invented internet, space flight, guided missiles, um, you know, the first trip to Mars, and the helmet is still lying there and stuff. Now to be clear, my position is that um, I love my country. I believe that Indians are some of the most hardest working people in the world, if not the hardest working people in the world, extremely intelligent. And uh, we are capable of doing much, much, much more things. But uh, when I hear such things, which becomes a matter of making my country a laughing stock in, uh, in the entire world, it becomes my duty as a nation living person to step up and dispel the myths. So before we start uh, speaking anything else, let us get right to the core of it and let's look at what the story of this, um, you know, let's, this lady who gave birth to 101 kids at one go, 100, 100 male infants and one female infant. How did that happen? Let us open the books of the Mahabharata and let us read the Samhava Parva and you hear this. Uh, episode in the Samhava Parva which is within the Adi Parva and you can read it directly online from sacred-texts.com and you can see the link on the screen. One day Rishi Vyas visited uh, King Dhritarashtra and Gandhari his queen uh, apparently served him so well uh, uh, the, the heart of servitude that it really touched Rishi Vyas and he granted her a boon. He asked her what do you want and she said I want a hundred sons who are as strong as my husband and the other she said so be it and um, soon the queen got pregnant and she stayed pregnant for two years and her rival queen kunti uh, who conceived after her already delivered a baby boy this infuriated queen gandhari so much that she bit upon her tummy which caused the feet to fetus to just drop out and what dropped out was a mound of hard flesh she asked for this mound of hard flesh to be discarded and um, before she could do that, Rishi Vyas, the one who had granted her the boon, uh, heard about it and came to know about it by his uh, you know, spiritual powers and he came immediately so that she doesn't discard it. And what he did was he asked for this mound of hard flesh, uh, you know, that cold water to be poured on it. Yes, you heard me right, cold water. And then he divided these, this big you know, mound of flesh into 101 parts, each not more bigger than a thumb. Yes, you heard me right, a thumb. And then he took these pieces. He asked for earthen jars to be filled with ghee. And for those who are not from India or the southeast part, um, ghee is nothing more than uh, clarified butter, which in those times uh, used to be made from the milk of buffalo or cow. And nowadays even made from vegetable oils. So he had these uh, vessels filled with ghee, put these thumb-sized pieces of hard flesh into it. He asked for the jars to be covered and kept for two years and after two years 
again that's yeah that's one more that's one more two years two years in the womb two years now outside of the womb and uh, when after two years the jars was open lo and behold what came out was 100 male infants and one female infant and that is the story you, you can read it i'm not mocking i don't mean to insult any of my hindu friends or not my friends whatever be the case but i don't need to mock anyone you can see the screen uh, the link on the screen you can read it so and this is what um, uh, Jian Rao equated as a uh, test tube baby in the olden times. So let us just take a quick crash course in what is a test tube baby all about. Uh, and no, it is not a baby born in a test tube. Like many people have heard say that. It's not a baby in a test tube. They don't get born in a test tube with a beaker and they, then they pop out of the beaker. No, it doesn't happen that way. So what actually happens? Test tube baby, also called IVF, is used basically to helping out women who are unable to conceive naturally. So for this, they first collect sperm, healthy sperms from a male donor. It could be the husband, it could be anybody else. Uh, so they take a semen sam sample so they, and they then remove the healthiest sperms from this semen sample. Next, um, it involves collecting the eggs from the ovaries of the mother using a suction device. And for fertilization, the eggs are placed in a petri dish and then artificially inseminated using the enriched and processed sperms from the sample collected earlier. Then the embryos are monitored for three to five days in a lab. That's it, three to five days in a lab. Remember what I'm saying. Uh, you can even verify everything that I'm saying online. And then the embryos are finally transferred. And here the fertilized eggs are transferred into the uterus of the mother. Back it goes in the mother. And then hormone therapies are done so that the embryos get implanted. This is usually done by, by using a syringe connected to a long catheter which is then inserted into the uterus via the cervix and embryos are then injected inside. That, my dear friends, is what is test tube baby all about. So it's nothing. If I summarize this, put it in layman's terms, they take the sperms from the man, from his body, they remove it. Then they take the egg from the woman, remove it. They bring them together the eggs are the sperms are inserted into the egg and then after they have uh, fertilized they check if it is fertilized and the embryos are placed back in the woman they, they are not put in a you know test tube and kept for you know growing up doesn't happen that way if i do a point on one point on point comparison between what we see in the mahabharata and what, what we see is actual process of a test tube baby we see five points the first thing in case of an IVF or test tube baby, conception and fertilization happens outside of the woman's body, as you saw. Now, in case of Gandhari and what we read in the Mahabharata, the conception and fertilization had already happened inside the body of Gandhari and the egg stayed there for two years. The fertilization had happened, even the fetus had grown for two years. Yes, you heard me right, two years. Point number two, the embryos are then put back into the woman's body for the growth of the baby. They are put back. Here the growth of the baby has happened outside of the human body. So in case of test tube baby, the baby grows inside the mother. In, test, in case of Mahabharata and Gandhari, the baby, uh, babies are growing outside of the mother's body. Next we see, what is put inside the body is a very minute embryo, like a microscopic embryo is put back in the woman's body, not like a big piece of embryo. No, it doesn't happen that way. But here in case of Gandhari and Mahabharata, we see that a thumb-sized piece of flesh is literally kept outside of the human body. Point number four, the fetus gets nourished by the mother's body. Okay, so there's a placenta and there is uh, the tube through which, uh, you know, food flows to the baby and back, uh, blood flows, nutrition flows, ox even oxygenated blood flows back into the child's body. So, and here I guess in case of Gandhari and Mahabharata, the, nutri the nutrition is key. Yes, uh, it's key, uh, clarified butter. The last but not the least, pregnancy terms in case of an IVF is the same as a natural birth, which is nine months. But in case of Gandhari, it was nine months, uh, sorry, two years inside the human body and two years outside of the human body. So if I do a comparison, there is absolutely no comparison between what we see in case of uh, the Mahabharata and Gandhari and what we see is the actual process of a test tube baby. Then if you make a science out of this, a few quick questions. If you still insist that it's still, still so adamant to make a science out of this, a few questions. How come Gandhari was pregnant for two years? Not really possible. Next, how did the babies get nourished? It was ghee finally, whereas the oxygenated blood 
ghee is not enough. Third thing, shouldn't the ghee have rotted in two years? It should have. Next, why two years? Come on, think about it. How come two years after being put in uh, the, um, in the earthen parts of ghee, did it happen? So two years in, two years out, plus how did the ghee not get rotted and how did the uh, babies get nourished? Those are the basic questions in case you still insist to make a science out of it. And now, as I was reading the fun section of such news articles, we go into the comment section and, and there, of course, okay, let me not blame them much for it. Uh, we see a lot of these Hindutva trolls saying that, oh, come on, you guys, you believe in a virgin birth. So what is the problem in you believing uh, a test tube baby in the old uh, olden times of India or uh, you know, stuff like that? So, well, uh, simple answer. Christians don't make a science out of it. They accept it as a spiritual, as a supernatural miracle. So let's go back to the Bible and we read in the book of Luke, chapter 1, verse 26 to 38. You can read the whole thing. I put it on the screen. But just to make it short, I'll just jump quickly to verse number 34 where Mary says to the angel, How can this be so since I have not known a man? Means I have not had any sort of relations with a man. How can I conceive that I'm a virgin? Um, so the angel answers her uh, in verse number 35. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. And the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And then in verse 37, the angel says, for with God, nothing will be impossible. So in short, the angel is saying, yes, it cannot happen. It, this is beyond human capability, but God is all powerful. God can do anything. And that is how the son of God will be born through you. That's what the answer that the angel has given to Mary and all the Christians accept it. Nobody bases science on that. So then the question comes, why the sudden rush by the Hindutva groups to show science and you know hegemonize everything under the sun? All the claims, all the research, all the science, everything is ours. Why is that? We don't, we never saw that happening up until a few years back. And why are the Christians not rushing to show miracles at all? Why is there, and it's not that they discard miracles, uh, they, but, but why are they not trying to show science and everything? It's nothing but the politics of nationalism at its core. You see, when the dispensation has nothing to say, they glue together nationalism and religion and brand everybody who questions it as anti-national and when the whole country of a billion people start shouting a particular story across the world then okay some people do fall for it and, and then of course that means easy words but if you look at uh, straight facts of the total number of Nobel prizes which has been won by Indians it is five in total and only one was uh, won by, by an Indian um, for science that is C.V. Raman for the Raman effect now, again, I'm not trying to disparage Indians in any manner because I'm an Indian and I love my country. Well, you see what happens, uh, born and brought up in this country. We are so bogged down with a day-to-day -day struggle of life, just surviving, just eking out a living. Uh, the corruption, the pollution, the death. Where is the time to innovate? Where is the time for the mind to relax and think of doing something better for the country? And that's where, you know, the innovation, the spirit of innovation dies. And if you just see, um, India ranks 133 out of 156 in the World Happiness Index. And even Pakistan is doing better. It's, it's slipped 11 places just between 2017 and 2018. And the West doesn't need to cook up some uh, you know, pseudoscience over here because if you just study the growth of the science age from the 16th century onwards, it's been dominated by Jews and Christians. Across all the Nobel Prizes, it's been taken up, taken over some of the most... Uh, powerful people in the world is uh, is from the Jews and Christians. So they don't need, need to run after such cooked up stories to you know claim um, superiority in any manner, to claim um, you know that we are better and this everything belongs to us because it's a known fact. You look up the, uh, the listing of Nobel Prizes and you see what I'm talking about. And here, just for your benefit, take the name, whether it is uh, Isaac Newton, Galileo, whether you're talking about uh, Tycho Brahe, Johannes Kepler, Louis Pasteur, Max Planck, the greats on which modern science is based. And before I wrap up, you know, something very interesting. G. N. Rao claimed test tube baby and uh, going forward stem cell research as a part of uh, the pseudoscience that they are propagating. If you study facts, not fiction, you'll see that the father of modern genetics was a Christian monk called as Gregor 
Mendel. So I'll leave you on that thought. So stay tuned. I'll see you soon. Take care and God bless.